Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We studied the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Oneness in Christ. <clears throat> it's about unity. And this particular lesson is entitled Unity in Faith. It's lesson number eight in that series for November 24 of 2018. And it's going to present some challenges, but before we get into those, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have come recognizing your presence and delighting in the opportunity to study your word. Help us to see clearly what you want us to learn from this lesson is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, <clears throat> one of the major things that defines finds churches is a list of common beliefs. And that's a pretty major thing. I mean, would you join a church that said, we believe this, and you say, no, I don't believe that. I believe this over here. Yeah, so that's one of the major issues. Well, there have been times in the history of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, which we're representing, when this became a serious issue. For example, in 1888, many Adventists have heard about that general conference session, which took place in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, there, there were serious disagreements at the general conference session. There were only 90 people at that session, by the way, all of them um, officially employed by the church, as far as I know. They were arguing about one, the ten horns of, the, of prophecy in D Daniel 7, which three were uprooted and so forth. And then two, they were arguing about justification by faith. And three, about what the what law was described in Galatians 3, 19 to 24. And that is a horrendous subject that we could spend easily spend two or three sessions on, which we don't have time for. I would encourage you, if you are interested in that issue, go back, go to the book by Ellen White entitled Selected Messages. This is book one in that series, pages 233 to 235. And she has some very striking words to say about um, those disagreements. Ellen White wept and deplored the differences of opinion that showed themselves at those meetings. She went out with one of the leaders from that series of meetings to, to visit a number of camp meetings in the East, and she wrote letters back to be published in the Review, and you can just hear, you can feel her tears as she recognizes the, the, the misunderstandings that had, had arisen in and all and she every, she talks about praying and and er, you know hours in the morning and then writing and so forth. Well, is it possible that we will ever agree on everything? No. No, it's not likely. Probably not going to happen. No. But we need to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. Yes. Now, is that possible? Yes. How is it possible? Well, love. if we all oh, go ahead through love, yeah. If we all followed the example of Jesus, there would be no problem. If we truly followed the example of Jesus, however, there were times when even Jesus found it necessary to speak very harsh words to his enemies, and you know about the story in, in John eight. And I'm just going to read one of those verses. It's verse forty four, John eight, verse forty four. I mean, imagine the Son of God standing up. The person who is love itself personified, saying, you are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires from the very beginning. And he's speaking this to the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jewish church. From the very beginning, he was a murderer. In other words, so are you. And has never been on the side of truth, and neither are you, because there is no truth in him and none in you. I mean, that's what he's saying. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he's a liar and the father of all lies, and so are you. <coughs> I mean, I don't know how that sort of grabs you, but it seems to be a little striking. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's pretty blunt, isn't it? Yes. A lot of character with what we usually think of. Yeah, exactly. Jesus well, he probably figured he would have one opportunity to address the Sanhedrin as a group. And this was it. Unfortunately, it is natural for us as human beings to assume that our favorite beliefs are essential and that everyone should agree with us. 
I mean, you know, all of you people should just agree with me and then there wouldn't be any problem, right? Well, the two sides in 1888 believed that they were arguing over the core beliefs of the church. And Ellen White said, what? You aren't even close to the old landmarks, the pillars, and so forth. She mentioned some of them. It's also unfortunate in some respects that because the church leadership, located in Battle Creek in those days, felt that Ellen White had been too seriously influenced by those from the West Coast, because she was now living in California, that terrible place in California, California where the, yeah, just those <laughs> heretics live, right? They the asked, wise men from the East didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They placed a call for her to go where? Australia. All the way to Australia. Maybe she will get out of our hair over there. Well, fortunately for us, what did she do down there? She wrote The Desire of Ages, Steps to Christ, and the Mount of Blessings. Wow. Wow, wow. I mean... If you've never been down there, yeah. there's still territory back in the mountains. Yeah. I got a chance to go through some of it a couple of years ago that barely anybody's been. She started Avondale from nothing. That's right. Some of that timber country, they didn't have uh, all the saws and equipment. You, you did it by the sweat of your brow. That's right. Yeah, she started a whole lot of stuff down there and she started a whole lot of stuff back here yes. by the sweat of her own brow. Yes, yes. Yeah. Well, Seventh-day Adventism is known in many parts of the world, I'm happy to say, as the church that follows the Bible most closely. That was true in many parts of Africa where I used to work. Surely there should be a defining, that should be a defining characteristic of God's end time remnant church, right? It should. Well, if you look at the sermons that are recorded in the, in the New Testament from the people who are our founders of Christianity, those sermons are focused on Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So what are we supposed to learn from the life and death of Jesus? Well, uh, how many years do we want to be yeah. here <laughs> discussing that yeah. question? I would like to suggest something that maybe isn't usually mentioned. In the broadest possible context, we can say that the life and death of Jesus gives us a choice. Mm, that's we, great concept, isn't it? We Think can, it. yeah. We can choose to live a life patterned after the life he lived, or we will die the death which he died by what? Separation, Separation from God. That is what will happen. Wow. Thus, the life and death of Jesus gives us the answers to the most important questions in the great controversy and showing that Satan was wrong in all of his accusations against God, making it impossible for us to approach the Father. So, I mean, his accusation. So now that we see that God is not the kind of person that Satan has made him out to be, we feel more comfortable in approaching him. And that's, that's just one of the blessings of the, work, of the work of Jesus. This process is sometimes called the atonement, which is an old English word that originally meant what? At one meant. Does that have something to do with unity? At one minute, it, yes. it certainly must, clearly. So where in the Bible would you look to get the clearest explanation of why Jesus had to die? Have you ever tried to go through and see, okay, who tells us exactly why Jesus had to die? There is one passage where one of the Bible writers specifically tries to explain why Jesus had to die. And it's Paul in Romans 3, 24 to 26. Margaret? You're going to share that with us. This, yeah, Romans 3, 24 to 26. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Jesus Christ, who set them free. God offered him so that by his blood he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins. But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. From the Good News Translation. Wow. Many of our Christian friends make a big deal out of this verse. And they roar through it till they get to the very end. He puts everyone who believes in Jesus right. 
But what is what do we find in here? It says three times the life and death of Jesus is for the purpose of demonstrating the righteousness of God. God. Wow. Well, why would that be an issue? Has anybody ever questioned the righteousness of God? Well, he's been accused of yeah. being arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacted, severe, tyrannical, despotic, uh, coercive. So, uh, uh, he and who's the one who's doing all of that? <laughs> <Just> demonstrating. <laughs> Can you say that a little Satan, of course. It's called projection in psychology. Exactly. <laughs> wow. So what does this imply? Do we need to know something more about the righteousness of God? Apparently Paul thought so and God thought so. Well, is, when he's demonstrating, he's teaching. Yeah. He's a teacher and not a penalty payer. Yeah. Could it be that there is something more to the plan of salvation than our salvation? And I, we are so, I mean, in other Christian groups, we, we, we go along with them somewhat. The big issue is how can I get saved? That's kind of a selfish approach, did you think it is? How can I get, what do I have to do to be, well now we, we understand why that's important. I mean, let's not put, let's not throw that away. That's important. But do we ever look beyond our own personal salvation and ask if there's something more involved in the great controversy and, and the whole conflict thing other than just how to save me? That's what the Philippian jailer asked when yeah. he was a baby in Christ. Mm -hmm. how, what must I do to be saved? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, now we're not trying to say that the life and death of Jesus didn't give forgiveness, didn't bring about salvation for all. That's almost a given. Everybody sort of accepts that. But is there something more? Well, some of us have spent a lot of time analyzing the great controversy and looking at it in Scripture and see what, 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 what we can find there. Fortunately for us, Ellen White led us in that direction. And that, that started, I might add, specifically after the 1888 General Conference. And she says that in that passage. Um, anyway, um, you can find a, a handout on that in our, at, our, at our website, theox.org. That's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. There's a handout available entitled The Great Controversy Described in Scripture. And uh, it's amazing how much of that is in the Bible, and yet none of our Christian friends, not any of them, maybe, maybe there's some individuals here and there, but in terms of churches, great controversy, huh? Not a clue. Well, it's very important that we understand that Christ's life and death are not just so that we can have our sins forgiven again and again. It is God's plan for us to become like his son. Furthermore, the truth about God and his government is more important than our salvation. If God were like Satan claims he is, and Jim already mentioned some of these things, Satan has made so many claims. Arbit God is arbitrary, exacting, vengeful, unforgiving, severe. Would you even want to live with someone like that forever? Christ's death was primarily to demonstrate the rightness of God and in contrast, of course, the evil of Satan. This is... You know that uh, text you read there from the uh, Good News Bible says our sins are forgiven. Mm -hmm. But Jesus never explained in any of his words the purpose of his death. No. Never was. You have to draw it through teaching. He's very not in your face in, in, in his teaching. He just let, lets you draw truth. So let's be very clear. I don't want anyone to go away with the idea that I don't think that uh, salvation is provided by God through the life and death of Jesus, that forgiveness is, is, is free. Jesus forgave the men who were pounding those nails through his arms, through his hands. He forgave them and they didn't even ask for it. So there's a bigger picture. Well, some scholars have pointed out that the return of Jesus Christ is the major theme in the New Testament. And that's not hard to figure out if you start reading through and you look at all the places where it's specifically mentioned and all the places where it's sort of implied, um, such as Matthew 24, 26, and 27, Revelation 1, 17, Acts 1, 11, 
uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18, and Revelation 19, 11 to 16, that's places where it's just mentioned very specifically, and, and there are more. Um, they're just a taste of what the New Testament says about the second coming of Jesus Christ. By the way, would there have been any, any reason for t Jesus to come the first time if he had no plans to come back? No. I don't think so. No. But he came and, at a specific time yeah. where it was a confluence right of, of, of the right time. Galatians uh, 4, verse 4. He came at the right time. What made that the right time? Well, well, you got Colossians 1, 19 and 20, and Ephesians 1, 9 and 10, and so forth. Yeah. So, uh, well, one thing that the Bible does not tell us, and I'm thankful for this, even though not everyone agree with this, he does not give us any specific information about the exact date of his coming. In fact, he tells us we will never know it until it happens. So this is not an issue about, okay, it's going to be 2028 20, or whatever. Uh, we're not, that's not part of our discussion. Um, there is something else, though. It's very clear in many parts of Scripture that there was delay. Think about the children of Israel. They could have gone from Mount Sinai. I mean, even if you, if you allow them six months to get down to Mount Sinai, and the whole year to build a tabernacle and, and get, their, get themselves organized at the foot of Mount Sinai. They could have gone from there to enter the, 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 the land of Canaan in two weeks. Yeah, I was going to say a late minimum of 40 days instead of 40, 40 years. years yeah. Yeah. So, of course, they went up there and then they sent those spies in. And, on, and so 40 years of delay, just imagine. And everybody over the age of 20 died out there in the desert. Well, yeah. And then you think about the parable of the ten virgins. It's a good thing we're so good that uh, yeah, it's course. only been, what, 173 uh, years, not 140 years, now. since 1844? Yep. Well, when you think about uh, the story of the ten virgins in, in, in Matthew 25, the first 13 verses there, does that scare you? Well, if we if we spend time with with God every day, mm. it really shouldn't scare us. It shouldn't. No. He tells us what we need yeah, to do. We need to spend time with mm -hmm. him on mm -hmm. a daily basis. To develop that living relationship yes. with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Yes. He promises me that he will cast out all fear. Yeah. I don't have to be afraid. That's right. Well, we as a Seventh-day Adventist church clearly believe in the Second Coming. It's part of our name. What does the word Adventist mean? Some of our friends would pronounce it Adventist. Some others say, we say Adventist. What does that word stand for? Coming. 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 We, believe we believe in the Second, second Advent. Coming. Yes. Yeah, second the Second Advent. Coming of Christ. So yes. it's it's one of the two major ideas and, 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 and doctrines that we, we thought were so important, we made it our name. And in the process of doing that, we have insisted that the Old Testament is an essential part of our understanding about God. We believe that the sacred annual cycle kept by the Jews was intended to be a pattern for the history of our world. Now this is something a lot of people do not understand, but what are, we, what are we saying here? Well, there was the, the Jewish sacred year began the day they left Egypt. And then 50 days later, they were at the foot of Mount Sinai, there was Pentecost. I mean, there were what we would now call Pentecost and so forth. And, and there's whole sequences. And then when we come to the end of the year, there was that time of, of cleansing and purification and so forth. And finally, the Day of Atonement. And then you start over with the new year. And our pioneers said, you know, there's some kind of pattern here. And maybe that pattern says something to us about the history. And if you look, it, you know, you can see along the way, there's, it sort of fits with what's happened in the, in, in the story of our world and its relationship to God. 
And Jesus is our, has, call, has been called our high priest many times, especially in the book of Hebrews. It's implied there, at least so. So we believe that Jesus basically was doing his, whatever you choose to call it, his ministry in the holy place, forgiving sins, uh, accepting people and so forth like that. The, the, the work symbolized by the work of the priest in the holy place up until 1844, October 22 of 1844 to be specific. And, we, and that was the, the Day of Atonement for that year. They, we believe that starting on that event, and on that time, at that time, from that on, there, there begins what was in Old Testament times known as the Day of Atonement. The, the, in our case, we believe it, be, it was the beginning of the pre-advent judgment. Was that the date, the Jewish date of the yes. Day of Atonement? That's how we arrived at that specific That's date. That yes. They went, contacted several groups um, and found the most conservative Jews and said, have you, how have you kept this? Well, you know, we've been keeping this for hundreds of years. This is a precise date. Yeah, they actually it went. Was the yeah, that's what they did. Yeah. Now, some people try to make a big deal about the fact that when Jesus, we talk about the Jesus, Jesus entering the holy place and he doesn't go to the Father yet or some people say that and so forth. Is there any place Jesus could go where the Father wasn't? No. Father is omnip uh, omnipresent. So what we're saying here, we're talking here about process, we're talking about function, we're talking about, you know, that kind of thing. We're not talking about geography. It's not a question of, okay, Jesus is here and the Father is there and they can't talk to each other. No, that would be craziness. So there's, there's none of that kind of stuff. Well. Um, Hebrews 8 and 9 and 10 um, spend a lot of time talking about the role of the high priest. Let me read just a few of those verses. But now Jesus has been given priestly work which is superior to theirs, theirs com comparing the work of Jesus with the work of the priests in the Old Testament times. Just as the covenant which he arranged between God and his people is a better one because it is based on promises of better things. Let's talk about that for just a second. What covenant was the Old Testament priest system supposed to be supporting and working on? That was the covenant made at the foot of Mount Sinai. And who did the promising? The people did. And how good did they do with that, keeping their promises? Very poorly. <laughs> Very poorly, yeah. Jesus, when he comes and he ministers according to the second covenant, what covenant, who made those promises? God. God did. How good is God at keeping his promises? He keeps his promises. And so Paul, Paul, and I believe, I believe Paul was the one who wrote Hebrews, but not everybody would agree with that. If there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, there would have been no need for a second one. So we should immediately recognize that there were some problems with that first covenant, right? And we've already suggested one of the main problems. Then he goes on into, into uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and I'm going to just pick out one verse, and it's not the verse that our Bible study guide has talked about. You need to read the whole, lot, whole thing, but um, I'm going to read two, actually two verses, Hebrews 9, 21 and 22, and someone, many of you will recognize this is a verse that's been used again and again. In the same way, Moses also sprinkled the blood on the sacred tent and over all things used in worship. Indeed, according to the law, almost everything is purified by blood and sin sins are forgiven only if blood is poured out. What system is it talking about there? Well, specifically, it's talking about Moses inaugurating yeah. the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. uh, which is what happened when Jesus ascended. He inaugurated the sanctuary for the work. Okay. So that we now have the kingdom of grace. Mm -hmm. We come boldly before the throne of uh, throne of grace yeah. to find help in, in time of need. So, Jesus, and, and then they, they put with these verses from Hebrews, 1 John 1, 9 to chapter 2, verse 2, 
But if we confess our sins to God, He will keep His promise and do what is right. Does God ever not do what's right? He will forgive us our sins and purify us from all our wrongdoing. If we say that we have not sinned, we make God out to be a liar and His word is not in us. And then chapter 2, verse 1, I'm writing this to you, my children, so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have someone who pleads with the Father on our behalf, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And Christ himself is the means by which our sins are forgiven, and not our sins only, but also the sins of everyone. So how many sins are forgiven? All of them. So forgiveness is never a problem on God's side. They might be on ours, but not on God's side. So, um, what kind of pleading is going on there? It almost makes it sound like Jesus is pleading with God. God, please be mm -hmm. kind to these people. But that's not what was happening. Okay, what how do we? What is happening? How do we know what's happening? Zechariah three. Okay, Daniel seven and Zechariah three. And Zechariah 3, it says specifically that Satan is the one who accuses us. He's the one that says, look at all these sins I've caused them to, to, to commit. And God says, yeah, that used to be the story of their lives, but Jesus died for them. They have followed him now. Their, their lives are being changed. They're safe to admit to my kingdom. And it just says that in a sort of so many words. And then if you turn over to Daniel 7, verses 9 through 13, you discover that who, who is involved in this judgment that's going on there? At least a hundred million angels. A hundred million of them. So this is not something, some God doing something in a smoke-filled back room like sometimes happens. It's a pretty big room, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's called the universe. <laughs> I think sometimes we try to answer all the questions so minutely that we yeah. get ourselves in trouble. It yeah. might be wiser to say, you know, we don't really know mm -hmm. the total details of every little part of the plan, but we trust God anyway. Mm -hmm. A bit like the proverbial blind men of India, yeah. and the, uh, elephant, you know, each says, this is the way it is, you know, and there's a part to that, but we don't, they don't see the hole. Yeah. And we don't the see one, the The one is yet. feeling the trunk, and someone else is feeling the leg, and someone else is feeling the side of the elephant, and someone else is feeling tail. his tail. I just think so often we try to have all the answers. And I think there's a danger to that myself. Yeah. You know. Well, yeah. let's be willing to. says each has, has given a message, but no one has ever attained to a full <laughs> understanding. So. Not if we're going to study know, it for the universe. The if we have a, a message, we can proclaim that, but yeah. it doesn't mean that we're. We should think that we, as Paul says, we know in part, we prophesy in part. We don't have time to do this right now, but I would encourage you out there, if you have a moment, open your Bible to Leviticus 16 and read what took place on the Day of Atonement. Something antitypical to that is what will hap happen in the pre-Advent judgment going on right now in heaven. Another crucial and very important doctrine for Seventh-day Adventists is our understanding of the Seventh-day Sabbath. We believe that it was God's gift to us, given right in the Garden of Eden, when he, res he rested, blessed that day, and sanctified it. So it was given specifically to the Jews, right? Given to the human race. Given to the human race. There were no Jews around when it was given, yes. Well, the Sabbath is an opportunity for us to meet with God, celebrate our relationship. A Jewish rabbi by the name of Abraham Joshua Heschel is famous for calling the Sabbath a palace in time. Uh, another Jewish rabbi I know talks about the Sabbath as being the queen of the week and all the rest of the days are to prepare for the coming of the queen. The children of Israel were reminded of the seven-day Sabbath and it is urged upon us in the Ten Commandments recorded in Exodus 28 to 11. A somewhat different explanation is given for, for observing the Sabbath in Deuteronomy 5. So, Exodus 28 to 11, what do we have there? That's Dennis, I think, right? Jackie. No, it's, no, Jackie. It's, me. it's Gary. Oh, it's Gary, okay. 
You're the one who got this that. This comes from the Good News Bible translation. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. You have six days in which to do your work, but the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. On that day, no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. In six days, I, the Lord, made the earth, the sky, the sea, and everything in them. But on the seventh day, I rested. That is why I, the Lord, blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Okay, well, we think this is something that happened at creation. That's wonderful back there in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Jackie, you have a little bit different to story on that, right? Deuteronomy 5, 12 to 15. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, as I, the Lord your God, have commanded you. You have six days in which to do your work. But the seventh day is a day of rest dedicated to me. And on that day no one is to work, neither you, your children, your slaves, your animals, nor the foreigners who live in your country. Your slaves must rest just as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that I, the Lord your God, rescued you by my great power and strength. That is why I command you to observe the Sabbath. Good News Bible. So the Sabbath really is a Jewish command, right? Mm -hmm. It's also a command for all the rest of us, of course. Mm -hmm. It was given to us before, the, everyone, before yeah. it was given to specifically to the Jews. When so, I, oh, go ahead. When I went to uh, the uh, 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 Dead Sea Scrolls exhibit down in yeah. L.A., mm -hmm. uh, they had this alcove off to the side, which was the Ten Words, which is mm. the Jewish way of saying the Ten Commandments. We right. They don't say it that way. And so it was uh, all from <coughs> the book of Deuteronomy. And when it came to the Fourth Commandment, they, I think they had in Hebrew and they may have been reading in English or maybe it was written. I think it was written in English as a translation. It actually had uh, in Deuteronomy the, the Sabbath uh, uh, in regard to creation inserted mm -hmm. Uh, just before the, uh, uh, the w remember that you were slaves passage. Mm -hmm. So I don't know why, how, or how that came about, but they, they sort that particular manus manuscript must have sewed those together somehow. Really? Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. I think you're next, Dennis. Ezekiel 12 and, <coughs> 12 and 20 remind us that the Sabbath is supposed to be a sign or contract between us and God forever. Ezekiel 20, 12, and 20. I made the keeping of the Sabbath a sign of the agreement between us to remind them that I, the Lord, made them holy. Verse 20, make the Sabbath a holy day so that it will be a sign of the covenant we made and will remind you that I am the Lord, your God. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about the Old Testament, so maybe the Sabbath doesn't, doesn't apply to us anymore. It's certainly not in the New Testament, is it? Mentioned many times. Yes, well, a lot of talk about the Sabbath in the New Testament. But look at some specific verses. Luke 4, verse 16. Then Jesus went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures, and he was handed the book of prophets, Isaiah, and so forth, and then you see what he did. But, and so some people say, well, of course he went to the synagogue on Sabbath because he was a Jew and that's what the Jews did, so that doesn't prove anything. Some people who want to be critical, that's, that's their approach. Well, what do they say about these places? Look at Acts 13, verses 14, 42, and 44, for example. They went up on from Perga and arrived in Antioch and Pisidia, and on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. Okay? As Paul and Barnabas were leaving the synagogue, the people invited them to come back the next Sabbath and tell them more about these things. Why didn't they say, well, come tomorrow? Well, you can join our worship service on Sunday. There's nothing about that. And it goes on. Chapter 16, verse 13. 17, well, actually, let's look at 16, verse 13. Acts 16, verse 13. On the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the riverside. There was no, they, they couldn't find any evidence for a synagogue in all of, of um, Philippi. Phil, yeah, Philippi. 
And so they said, uh, I know, I'm sorry, this was Thessalonica, right? Philippi. Well, it is Philippi, yeah. Okay, just reminding myself. So what did they do? They went out beside the river because they knew that's a place where maybe Jews would gather. And lo and behold, they ran into a woman. They started talking to her. She became a Christian convert. And then she invited all these people to come and stay. And I don't know how many of them were traveling together. There were at least three or four of them. Ladies, how would you feel about inviting half a dozen strange men walking around the countryside to come stay at your house? Mm -hmm. uh, all men are strange. <laughs> <laughs> now, just a minute, Jackie. <laughs> yeah, we don't need to go quite that far. Well, Paul was still observing the Sabbath even when, you know, there's no specific mention of having to do it to join the Jews. Even when he's talking to Gentiles, he's doing, he does it on the Sabbath. Um, Paul and others, many years after the resurrection, carefully observed the seven-day Sabbath. Jesus repeatedly pe performed miracles of healing on the Sabbath to try to point out what kinds of things were appropriate to do on that day. Can you think of one or two miracles that Jesus performed on the Sabbath? The lame man by the pool. The lame man by the pool of Bethesda? In Jerusalem. In Jerusalem, right there, you know, just spitting distance from the temple. A uh, man with a withered hand in the synagogue. Yeah, the north, I think. exactly. And, and, and there's other, play, other things that we could mention, but very specifically, um, yeah, things why that... Why not all the other miracles that we know Jesus performed, mentioned, but we have the ones on the Sabbath? Yeah, good question. Well... To spread out, that out a little bit more, look at Hebrews 4, verse 9. As it is, however, there still remains for God's people a rest like God's resting on the seventh day. What does that imply? Who, who, who was the first one who rested on the seventh day? God. 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 It was mm -hmm. our second day. How many, other, how many other planets or moons do we know of who have a weekly cycle of seven days? No. Zero. We don't know of any. It's only here, which we have a seven-day weekly cycle. So it was for us. Jesus said that in Mark 2, didn't he? 27, 28. Well, and, and then Matthew 11 talks about God providing a rest. They make it clear that God, these two verses, make it clear that God is still calling us to come to him and enjoy a time of rest. Do you find the Sabbath to be a wonderful time of rest and respite from your daily activities of the week? I find the Sabbath is the best day of the week. Every week it's the best day of the week. Well, another very unique doctrine, or almost unique doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists is the doctrine spelled out very clearly in Genesis 2, verse 7. Way back in the very beginning, what happened right there? Then the Lord God took some soil from the ground, formed a man out of it. He breathed life-giving breath into his nostrils, and the man began to live. Began to live. I'm sorry, I should have. That was yours, wasn't it, Myra? No, it was Gordon's. Okay. okay. We were not given immortality. We do not pass on to another world somewhere at the point of death. Only God has immortality. 1 Timothy 6, verse 16. <coughs> Those who are dead have no consciousness. Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6. That's a very famous one. Let me just look at that one. Yes, the living know they're going to die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. They're completely forgotten. Their loves, their hates, their passions all died with them. They will never again take part in anything that happens in this world. Is that true? The Not dead? quite no. true. Not quite true at the end, is it? This is written by Solomon, and he, he had a little bit of a limited view still of what was going on at the second coming, and therefore... But, um, but the first part is very clear. However, Jesus did promise us immortality if we stay connected to him. Okay, 1 Corinthians. Now my turn. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 54 from the Good News Bible. Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised. 
never to die again, and we shall be all changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has changed into immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Can I say hallelujah? Yeah. Hallelujah. Oh. <laughs> Amen. Absolutely. Just wonderful. These passages should make it very clear that the time of the resurrection, which will occur at the second coming of Jesus, those who are still alive on this earth will be miraculously changed, and those who have lived, uh, I'm sorry, who have died, will be resurrected from their grave to ascend to live with God forever. And uh, maybe, we, I think we've got time to read that passage. It's found in uh, 1 Thessalonians 4. I thought I had it listed here, but let's just go there. Uh, Oh, uh, hold on here. Let's try again here. Would you like me to read? Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Our brothers and sisters, we want you to know the truth about those who have died, so that you will not be sad, as are those who have no hope. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will take back with Jesus those who have died believing in him. What we are teaching you now is the Lord's teaching. We who are alive on the day the Lord comes will not go ahead of those who have died. There will be the shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet, and the Lord himself will come down from heaven. So what, what do we call that Lord coming down from heaven event? Second coming. Second That's coming. the second coming. Um, those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. Then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So then encourage one another with these words. That should be pretty clear, right? Mm -hmm. So um, hopefully every Seventh-day Adventist recognizes that Jesus is our example and the one who is able to save us. He is our only source of righteousness. We've talked about that. We can never be saved because of our own works. Christ's righteousness, which is made available to us through the work of the Holy Spirit, is our only hope. And Jim B. Christ was treated as we deserve that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned because of sin in which he had no share, that we may, excuse me, that we might be set right by his righteousness in which we had no share. He suffered the death which was ours, that we might receive the life which was his. Okay, it is our pages, page 25. Okay, very good. We have touched just briefly on some of our major doctrines and fundamental beliefs. There are many more. But this package sets us apart from all other religions and denominations. Our understanding of the great controversy gives us a, a unique perspective on every other teaching in the Bible. And I would like to take, go one extra step here uh, in, in, that, in looking at that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, our understanding of Scripture allows us, with an understanding of the great controversy, which Ellen White helped us to see, allows us to put together modern science, understood correctly, with the Bible and be able to say that there's no difference, there's no conflict, there's no no fight between science and scripture that it all fits together. If you, if you do not have the great controversy version and it's, it's the way it helps us to understand the Bible, then you run into these conflicts. So I think we are enormously blessed. So I would like to ask you, how has your understanding of the core teachings of the Seventh-day Adventist Church impacted your life? Well, probably, well, let me just ask you. Well, we guide our lives by something. Mm -hmm. Everyone does. Yeah. Is it just total pleasure, or is it a little deeper, thoughtful contemplation of what we're really here for and mm -hmm. what's in the universe? Mm -hmm. 
And that's where I think we study and spend our time with Scripture daily, and God's Spirit works on our minds. Yeah. I would okay. say the great controversy, and chapter 29, probably the one most important verse or chapter to me, that has affected everything and the way I approach anything in from the Bible, mm -hmm. is the chapter 29 of the book the of great controversy. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Look that up. Well, I have a question. How much of the great controversy in Scripture is brought out in the Sabbath School Bible Study Guide? None. So you added something to the lesson. Dear me, would oh. we do that? Okay. No, I, yeah, that isn't part of the discussion in the, in the Bible study guide. Uh, but let's think about that. Think about the ways it impacts us. We go to church on Sabbath. Why do we do that? Because of the, our belief in the Sabbath. Uh, I mean, and, and if someone, I recently had the unfortunate experience of burying my mother. Well, what we say at funerals and so forth and, and all that we go through in times like that, it's based on what our understanding is of what happens to people when they die. Mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you go and you listen to a, a, a funeral of someone who has a different kind of a view and you wonder where in the world did that stuff come from? Well, It's interesting, we've been to several Catholic funerals mm -hmm. And it's interesting how, on one point, they say, well, he's up in heaven, but then mm -hmm. they're waiting for Jesus to come. I mean, at the same, mm -hmm. in the same sermon, Almost they put... the same breath. They Sometimes. put those two things together, and you think, are you thinking about what you're saying? Yeah. <laughs> I took one of my patients once, because one week I do therapeutic trial visits, and she wanted to go to a funeral, and she was an inpatient in psych, and I heard that very same thing in our local church over here on Mountain View. Really? And it was interesting to me because it sounded like there was no need for the resurrection if you're already in heaven. Yeah, and why? Yet, yeah, the why? Bible teaches that you will be resurrected. Yeah. yeah. Well, those that are sent to... Uh, Father Pat said that. So. Those that are sent to heaven after they die, wouldn't that be kind of like a hell? Especially if they have kids. If they have to look and, down and, and see what's happening. Wouldn't it be, it'd be a miserable experience? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, and, and Alan White, thoughtful. yeah, Alan White says, if Satan were taken to heaven, the purity and love that expressed in heaven would be torture for him, because yeah. he's just he is just totally, completely uh, obs obsessed with his own selfishness. Oh yeah, he's, yeah. He's, yeah. he's been transformed the wrong way. Yeah, exactly. Well, are we clear in our understanding of the great controversy and its implications for all that we believe? Do we understand what is required for us to, to be sealed permanently as God's faithful people? Jim? Just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, and it's not any seal or mark that you can see, but a settling into the truth, both, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved just as soon as God's people are sealed and prepared for the shaking. It will come. Indeed, it has begun already. The judgments of God are now upon the land to give us warning that we may know what is coming. That's from a manuscript written in 1902. Yep. Quoted in the Bible Commentary, Volume 4. Great. Oh. Well, and I can tell you that back in those late 1890s and in the 1900s, there were things going on in the U.S. Congress that made it look like things could wrap up. The church has a very distinct reason for its existence. Our efforts should be focused on reaching out to those around us who have not heard the truth. We must not be just a friendly club. Have you ever been in a church where it was a kind of a friendly club? How much of our time is spent in reaching out to others with the gospel? We spend a lot of time doing that. Do we recognize that God's way is the only way in which we can live together in harmony, even here, but especially for eternity? I mean, you know, I, I almost hesitate to say this, but we, we get married. And we struggle with getting along with one other person. 
whose opinions are not the same as ours. And we're going to go and live. <laughs> you aren't talking about us, are you? <laughs> did I, I didn't mention, did I mention any names? No, no. Uh, <clears throat> and we're going to go and live with people from every generation, every place in the world, and we're going to get along with them in perfect harmony. I, I think that marriage is probably just a kind of a, a warm-up. Training ground. Training ground, yeah. And throw in a couple kids. Mm. Yeah, yeah, throw in a couple. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Do we recognize that God's way is the only way in which we can live together in harmony even here, but especially for eternity? Selfishness, which is Satan's way, will ultimately self-destruct. Do we want to be a part of that? While we believe in unity, we do not believe in uniformity. It is not necessarily for everyone, for every one of us to agree on every single detail. Having differences of opinion and differences in our understanding of Scripture is a powerful reason for sharing ideas and helping our faith grow. I mean, that's why we have times like this, right? Actually, says if we're not making progress, God will send in heresies to yep. stir us. Uh, to go yeah. back to scripture and study and dig deeper. Some of you have heard me saying, if, you're, if the God you worship is exactly the same this year as it was last year, you're worshiping a graven image. Mm -hmm. It's idol worship. Yeah. False image of God is idol worship. Many of us have seen television programs and even photographs of events in major sporting venues, and, it, and it, it's sometimes done in other places. And you know, all these people come in and I don't know how they do this exactly. There's probably a card or something that's set on their, on their seat when they sit down. And so they give a signal and everybody holds up these cards. Now, your card has probably just one color on it. But when you know, there's a whole stadium, so the, you know there's different colors. And so when everybody holds their, up their card, what do you see? Some message. A or massive some picture or a message or something like this. And, and you, could, you could never do that by yourself. But working together, the whole group does it. How often do we do things as a church group that require working together? Do you and those you associate with in your church have a similar understanding of why Jesus had to die? Why did Paul, maybe we should go back and read Romans 3 a few more times, huh? Why did Paul say that a clear understanding of the life and death of Jesus would tear down barriers in Ephesians 2.14? And looking at our time, I'm going to just move on. Scripture calls for the church to be united, while at the same time to hold fast to truth. This poses a dilemma. Truth is, by nature, exclusive. Pursuing truth involves rejection of error and is associated with the concept of purity. Thus, truth can be seen as selective and exclusive. On the other hand, unity is, by nature, inclusive. Consequently, Discussions about unity often emphasize unity at the expense of truth or emphasize truth at the expense of unity. How then do we resolve this tension and pursue both truth and unity? Part of the solution can be found by examining what the Bible says about truth. So how about it? Who's, who is the truth in the Bible? Jesus. Jesus. So if we we're going to follow the truth, what would happen? He would be would changed be, into his image. Yeah, you'd yeah. and you would have perfect unity. So if real truth is followed. Now, one of the problems is that people think that what I think is right is the truth. And what you think right is right might not be the truth. So we're arguing between the back and forth. So we're not, re not prepared, many of us, to say, okay, let's agree with what the Bible says. Or even, you know, and... and of course, there are differences of, differences of interpretation. I mean, why do we have so many different churches? You so, know, as about uh, 18 years ago, they said there was about 33,000 Christian religions. Yeah. You know, and it's probably not diminished since that time. Yeah. Clearly, God's Word sets out what God wants us to believe as the truth. Those truths are not just an exercise in intellectual assent. They are intended to be understood 
and incorporate it into our lives. <clears throat> With the help of the Holy Spirit, we can become a part of God's faithful end time people. So how do you feel when you read the parable of the ten virgins recorded in Matthew 25? Does it worry you? In this lesson, we have reviewed briefly our understanding of the seventh-day Sabbath and our basic core belief about the life and death of Jesus and what it teaches us about the great controversy. We believe the annual religious history of the Jews in the Old Testament gives us a clue about what happened in 1844 and helps us to realize that we are in the time of the pre-advent judgment. Now, there used to be another name for the pre-advent judgment. Do you remember what it was? Investigative judgment. Investigative judgment. That was an unfortunate term, I think. This is not, because many people think that, oh, investigative judgment, mean God doesn't know what's going on, so he's up yeah. there checking things out. No, this is a pre-advent judgment. It's not an investigative judgment. Now, it's, it's true that as God goes through the records, the angels may learn some things they didn't know before. And clearly, that's, that's a process that goes on. But it's not an investigative judgment for God. Well, this collection of beliefs, along with the others that we hold, make us significantly different from all other Christian groups. Does recognizing that we are different in our beliefs help to bring us together with those with, of like beliefs? I don't know how many of you have had the experience of traveling around the world, here and there in different places, and you always feel comfortable when you meet with another Adventist. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, you may hardly be able to communicate because of language differences or whatever like this, but, and you go, to a church, you go to an Adventist church and you feel at home even if you don't understand a word that they're, that they're worshiping, that they're saying you're, up in front. You're mm -hmm. part of a family. Yeah, really. you're part of a family. Yeah. So that's I'm a really sure important that. point, I think. If we believe that the life of Jesus is our example and we are truly trying to follow him, how should that impact how we deal with others who disagree with us theologically? Well, we know that, look at the life of Jesus. He was incredibly gracious to people who had all sorts of crazy ideas except on occasion where he felt it was necessary to really speak out. and. That might happen to some of us at some time in the future. So once again, I would ask you, how has your understanding of the great controversy impacted your life? Have you reviewed our 28 fundamental beliefs recently? Are there some with which you do not agree? And why would that be? Our kind and fa loving Father, we thank you for these privileges we have to come apart and, and study your word together. We thank you for this opportunity to project what we have to say around the world to others who might want to listen. But most of all, Lord, we ask that you will touch our hearts and the hearts of those who are listening with the truths that we have been able to touch on today is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.